Hi, welcome to Speaking of Mysteries. I'm Bruce Southworth, mystery reviewer for the Minneapolis Star Tribune. My guest today is Randy Wayne White, the creator of Doc Ford, a former covert agent turned marine biologist who's now living and working in Sanibel Island, Florida, in a very tight-knit community called Dinkins Bay. Uh, Doc was introduced in the first book in the series in 1990. The book was called Sanibel Flats, and the newest book, the ninth, was just published this year, 2002, um, is called 12 Mile Limit. And I think most of your books have been published by Putnam, with the exception of a very few. Uh, Randy's also been a fishing guide for many, many years. Uh, he's been a columnist, and I guess probably the best term would be adventurer to uh, <laughs> tack on there. I don't know about that. Well, there's a lot of other things going on. I should mention he's a, a New York Times bestselling author as well. Um, let's start perhaps with just a quick um, overview, if you don't mind, of uh, what goes on in 12 Mile Limit. 12 Mile Limit. Well, first of all, it's great to be here. Thanks. It's great to be back in Minnesota, the spiritual home of Burt Blylevin, my buddy. Great. And John Camp Sanford, a mm -hmm. brilliant guy and a terrific felon, so it's really good to be back here. Uh, 12 Mile Limit is the ninth in the Doc Ford uh, thriller mystery series. Doc Ford is a Florida marine biologist with kind of a shady, tough past. And 12 Mile Limit is um, it's based on a, an actual event, and I was intimately involved with that event, Bruce. In uh, November of 1994, four scuba divers left a small island on the Gulf Coast of Florida, Marco Island, in a small boat. They ran 52 nautical miles offshore and anchored over an old sunken freighter called the Baja California. And when they started out, winds were 10 to 15 knots, but when they anchored, they picked up to 15 to 18 knots. That's an unpleasant time to be out in the open sea in a small boat. Mm -hmm. And during the course of the dive, the boat swamped and it turned turtle. It uh, essentially sunk, but not to the bottom. Mm. And um, they hung onto the anchor line. All four divers were wearing inflated vests, life vests, or uh, uh, buoyancy uh, compensating compensator vests, and wetsuits. And they hung onto the anchor line. Uh, sunset was just after 5 p.m. Uh, moon set was the same time, dark of the moon. Wind had picked up to ten, uh, 15 to 20 knots. And at 7 p.m., the boat sank to the bottom, mm. and they were set adrift. So these four guys set adrift. And um, two days later, one of the divers was found, standing naked on the highest platform of, nav of a navigational marker, slightly more than three miles away, and no trace, no trace of the other three divers was ever found. Mm. So the book's based on that, and I, yeah. and I investigated the whole thing, interviewed everyone, in, everybody involved. I dived the wreck, and... Uh, so to, to me, it's the most most emotionally compelling of the Doc Ford novels. Well, I read the, uh, you also d kind of did a column, I think, in 1995 for Outside Magazine right. detailing this. Yeah. And, and, and some of the stuff that you wrote there is, is kind of moved almost verbatim over into the book. I did, Other yeah. than changing some things. But one of the things I found most intriguing uh, that Doc Ford did in the book, and, and apparently you did as well, was to get some sense of, you know, how lost or lonely or afraid those people might be to just go off the back of the boat and put yourself adrift. I mean, we had a line, but everything. And that must have been a very strange sensation, To It was. We anchored over that wreck uh, where these divers were lost in, uh, exactly one month to the day after their boat sank. Uh, wind conditions were precisely the same out of the northeast, 15 to 20 knots. And that night, I couldn't sleep. And um, I got in the water. And Bruce, it was absolutely existential. It, and I'm not an inexperienced open water swimmer. I mean, for my 50th birthday, I swam from uh, St. Petersburg to Tampa. That's four miles. My goodness. So even for someone like me, I got in the water, and uh, you would feel, you would hear the wave coming. You couldn't see it because it was so dark. Mm. And then you would feel this kind of flooding, expanding buoyancy, and you would be catapulted up to the stars. And from the top of the wave, you could see three miles away this flashing strobe, this navigational marker to which the one survivor swam. And then the wave would, colla the wave would collapse beneath you, and it would suck you down into this uh, valley, this, this cavern, this, this abyss, absolute darkness. So it was very emotionally powerful. And after, investiga after diving the rack, after investigating all the aspects, uh, I became an acquaintance and then a friend of one of the fathers of the missing divers. And I circulated posters, photographs of the missing divers uh, in Cuba, in Colombia, in Nicaragua, because the family's last stronghold of hope was that their three children, these three missing uh, divers, had been picked up by some pirate vessel. 
So when I decided to write 12 mile limit, I took the, the precise scaffolding effect as best I could. Mm -hmm. And into that scaffolding effect, I dropped entirely fictional characters. And the only thing the characters of fiction have in common with the, with the characters of fact, the actual divers, is I think they were all good and decent people. Uh, there were three white divers, one black. Uh, and they all had a lot more to give. And one of the, uh, one of the divers is a, sort of a long-standing character in the series, Janet, who's a friend of, mm. of Doc Ford's who works in his uh, laboratory or his, his lab. Right. Um, so which is one of his main connections to draw him in. I thought it was real interesting too that that uh, you take a springboard off the um, the idea that perhaps you know a boat had picked them up or something and kind of blended that into the new new book as well. I don't want to go any further than that really because it'll yeah. give some things away. But the um, uh, it was it was kind of interesting to take all of that and then go off in that particular direction. Um, more generically, I'm I'm curious now having written nine of these books. In your mind, how much, if any, I guess, has Doc Ford changed? I mean, how has he evolved over the course of the nine books? Well, the first book was Sanibel Flats, and um, the ninth is 12 Mile Limit. In that space, uh, Doc Ford, the marine biologist, who is a purely linear, pragmatic, uh, unemotional guy, mm -hmm. um, the reader has in each bo book in incremental, in geez, I can't say it incrementally, mm -hmm. uh, has learned a little bit more about Doc's kind of sh uh, sinister past. And uh, that was, I do very few things in my life by design, but that was, <laughs> that was one of them. So in 12 Mile Limit, the reader actually learns what Doc Ford did in his past. He was a government agent mm -hmm. and a very tough guy. And they finally find out the truth about Doc. Yeah, it was a, it was a nicely revealing across the book to just get all of a sudden that clarity of that it had been so murky for so long. I, I enjoyed that. Um, we can't forget, though, his, his rather quirky friend, Tomlinson, um, <laughs> who's been uh, described as a brilliant eccentric leftover hippie uh, with a Harvard PhD. Mm -hmm. um, struck me a little like Timothy Leary, but... I guess. I don't... I never knew Timothy Leary. I certainly read about him. Uh, now, I have friends that there may be some similarities. I know too many attorneys to say that's true. Um, <laughs> A great friend of mine is Bill Spaceman Lee. He pitched for the Red Sox for many years. They don't call him Spaceman because he pitched uh, for the Air Force Academy. Uh, Bill Lee is the guy who, uh, back during the Great World Series between the Cincinnati Reds and the Boston Red Sox, Bill was one of the starting pitchers, was interviewed by, I think, Sports Illustrated. And he was on the cover in a, on the pitcher's mound, full wind up in a spacesuit, wearing a beanie cap. And during the course of this interview, or some interview, uh, the reporter asked Bill, uh, do you think there's a drug problem in Major League Baseball? And Bill said, no, it's great. I can get anything I want, you know. It's, um, and uh, then later was asked, uh, do you prefer uh, AstroTurf or natural grass? And Bill goes, I don't know, man. I've never smoked AstroTurf. So there, and Bill comes down on stage with me every winter in South Florida. And, and Bill's a big uh, left-handed guy, which is, you know, left-handers, ought to, particularly pitchers, ought to come with a little warning tag on their toe. <laughs> and he's got long, scraggly hair and a long beard, and he wears these combs that little girls wear with the spring-loaded combs. Oh, so yeah. he'll put them in his hair, and he'll have a shock of hair here and a shock of hair here. And when he pitches, he'll have... He's an unusual-looking guy, so... I'd say so, yeah. Yeah. So there's, there's, there's elements there, yeah. I was curious, from a, from a writing point of view, I mean, he's both very kind of comical about the series. Tomlinson is, yeah. Right. And at the same time, um, sort of the natural insight he has to people and uh, the role he plays sort of spiritually mm. is, is very serious. I was just curious, um, when you're writing that character, how do you kind of work the balance so you don't make him too clown-like and at the same time too preachy or too serious? Well, it's a curious thing. These characters, Doc Ford, the biologist, and Tomlinson, the uh, unapologetic hippie, mm -hmm. uh, since their creation, they simply behave as they would behave. I have very little to do with it. It kind of sounds like schizophrenia, doesn't it? Right? <laughs> it does, but you'd be surprised how many authors say the same thing. It is true. Uh, they, they simply, they've taken on a life of their own. And uh, when I started the series, and I had no idea it was going to be a series, mm -hmm. uh, I was a fishing guide for 13 years. My marina closed in 1987 and absolutely not qualified to do anything else, Bruce. Mm -hmm. So I wrote a book. Uh, Sandoval Flats, and I wanted to have one character who is purely analytical, um, mathematical, mm -hmm. 
And I wanted to have another character who is purely spiritual and empathetic and intuitive. Because I think we're all made up of those two basic cerebral components. Mm -hmm. And certainly in myself, perhaps, and all of us, those two elements are often at odds. So I, th I thought I could have these two characters play off each other. It, good, too, because the, I mean, you, you, the dialogue that they can have can actually sort of bring to the surface or bring out in the open some of the, the conflict or the similarity in those cases between those two styles of people. And this conversation is just absolutely fascinating. Oh, thanks, Bruce. Um, I have read in a, in a variety of places um, that uh, people, you know, critics and so on, consider you the, uh, the rightful heir, I think it was the quote, to John D. MacDonald's oh. Travis, uh, and Travis McGee and so on. Um, curious what you think about that comparison. I mean, how, if you, if you thought about it at all, do you think it's at all accurate or just sort of let it go and... Well, for, it's hugely flattering, but uh, I knew John MacDonald. Uh, mm. I like John MacDonald. And Bruce, I am no John D. MacDonald, <laughs> to paraphrase <laughs> a former before. presidential candidate. Uh, no, it's, it's gigantically flattering, but MacDonald is, uh, is, not was, is uh, an American icon, so no, it's I don't, compared to John MacDonald. Mm. There uh, must be giving that impression of that, that same kind of a sense, though, to an awful lot of people. Um, another thing I've, I've been very impressed with across the books is, and, and again, this may seem silly, but even the sort of the subplots, sub-stories that you put into the, into the books mm. are as crisp and as delineated as sort of the overall story. They're not, I mean, they really don't come across as filler or diversions or anything like that. Right. Do you work at, at making sure even those little things are as, as precisely detailed and probably researched as the big story? I do. Writing's a pain in the rump. It's just work after work. It's, but I'm... It's one of the few things that I just absolutely take seriously beyond any reasonable sense of behavior. <laughs> so I just I research things to death, and I just write and rewrite and rewrite and rewrite, and it's, it's what I love. It's my calling. And uh, um, I was a guide for 13 years. I think I mentioned that. I did more than 3,000 charters, Tarpon Bay Marina, Santa Blaya, Florida. I was never a great guide. You know, mm. my love, I was okay. I was confident, but... Uh, Writing is is my calling, and I do it as best I can. Just in passing, uh, I mentioned that the running through Twelve Mile Island, there's a uh, sort of again a subplot involving an octopus. Yeah, octopi. Is just octop yeah, it's just hilarious. I mean, it's just so strange. But the uh, I was asked by someone else, you know, about the stories, and I was telling them, and they said, you really can learn a lot from the research that you've done about in this case, octopi, or you know, in other cases, in other one of your books, the uh, indigenous people of southern Florida. Yeah, I live, in the, I live in the Indian mounds that they yeah. built more than a thousand years ago. I live on an old mound, mm -hmm. uh, in an old house, right on the bay, an acre in the water, and it's uh, uh, the Calusa. That's the generic name for these people who far predated the Seminole or the Miccosukee. Mm -hmm. And at the time of Spanish contact, uh, the Spaniards described them as giants, physically. They were much bigger than the Spaniards. And I like the idea that on this old mound where I live on this island, uh, that for more than a thousand years, people have been telling stories. Mm -hmm. And that's what I do at this small place. I like that. And a nice connection there. Yeah. The, uh, the Calusa and, and that whole sort of uh, subject uh, was, was really the, um, the core, if you will, of 10,000 Islands. Right. That, that yeah. book. Um, where a young girl found an artifact and, and uh, mm -hmm. ultimately was, was murdered. But there's an awful lot of, I mean, there's a nice kind of spirituality there as well. That even Doc got very affected by it. I was, yeah. I was kind of impressed that that would affect him. And that kind of threw the mathematical side, as you'd call him, a little bit out of kilter. Yeah, Doc's often at, out, at odds with his uh, spiritual side. I'm, I certainly am. I'd love to be a spiritual person. I'm not a particularly spiritual person. Love to believe in UFOs, don't. And, uh, or alien beings, anyway. Except for maybe Bill Lee and a couple of other left-handed people I know, but uh, <laughs> no, Burt Blylevin would... I'm left-handed, too, so... It's well, I know that. That's why I meant. Uh, <laughs> Burt Blylevin would be another one. Off. No, he's a sweetheart. Mm. But, uh, um, this, this, is, this is something I've been curious about, too, about the plots for your books. Um, do they sort of start from more of the social-political where, you know, events that are going on and that's kind of said, ah, within that I can put Doc forward and do something? Or do you come up with a specific idea which, you know, then you can kind of build the rest of it and around him? 
when you're putting a, a book together? Where do, where do you start? I don't know, Bruce. I start probably not the way I should. I'm not, I just, it's something happened. There was an event and the characters take off from there. I try to have plots and subplots. I try to have themes. Mm -hmm. And probably to, to the benefit of the, the readers, they, they never know what those themes are. I never, I try not to impose on them <laughs> in terms of being heavy handed, but uh, uh, 12 mile limit, one of the underlying themes was um, environmentalism. Mm -hmm. uh, the thing with the octopi, it's, uh, and there's a quote in there from Darwin about uh, man having evolved mm -hmm. from the chain of primates and has evolved to the, to the, the god-like creature that some believe we are. And, uh, environmentalism and the so-called environmentalists, increasingly it's difficult to tell um, who is the good person and who is the bad person who is telling the truth, because environmentalism has become a multi-million dollar industry. And the so-called environmentalists certainly have their own agendas. And as one who cares deeply about his homeland, not just Florida, but this great nation, um, I stand farther and farther back and read more and more to try to figure out who is telling the truth. And I'll tell you what, oftentimes the environmentalists are as big a liars as the, the so-called developers. Well, know. they certainly have to keep their their direction or their agenda going. Well, the sad thing is when the, 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 when biologists lose their credibility, they put us all in a very tough spot, mm -hmm. particularly state biologists and federal biologists. It's, they need to do their science, not their politics. And increasingly, it's, uh, biologists are, have become politicians, not scientists. And that puts us all in a st sad state of affairs. There's a there's a quote um, or a line from from Twelve Mile Limit that I thought was really interesting and that I think fits this uh, in the book. It says uh, an irony of government intervention by disabling the people who it, people it can control, bureaucracy empowers the people or nations that it cannot control. And uh, there's such a grand scope for for mm -hmm. that particular thought. But I also thought on a very small level, it could be again the environmentalists and the working the government, so to speak, because there's another element running through here of whether or not Dinkins Bay is going to be shut down. Yeah, my old marina Tarpon Bay, which ultimately was shut down mm -hmm. by the federal government. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. And so it, it, it was kind of interesting that you could kind of go very small and very large with that whole That's thought. That's kind of a cool quote. Wait, read that again. You got <laughs> <laughs> I wrote that. Yeah, uh, it's on page 171 of the advanced copy, anyway. You are prepared. Um, an irony of government intervention. By disabling the people it can control, bureaucracy empowers the people and nations it cannot control. That's true. Certainly true of the sea. There are no gates out there. You know, as we um, exile and uh, disempower our own commercial fishery, mm -hmm. we empower and uh, elevate the foreign fisheries, and they don't have our laws. So they absolutely destroy the sea bottom. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, there are no gates out there. Okay. Yeah. You also, uh, there was uh, in, um, let's see, I think this was something you wrote about uh, the second book, Heat Islands. Uh, you said that uh, Florida attracts predators. Anyone can come to this state, I'm kind of paraphrasing, and make claims about their lives that will be accepted without question. Yeah, that's true. And I was curious as to, I mean, because I think of predators more of the sort of the land developers, the people who are going to swallow up things, make a, make a major change. They certainly have certainly done that, yeah. yeah. But do you, do you consider tourists who come down, in a way, the same way? No, 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 no. Look, uh, we're all tourists. From the moment we leave the maternity ward, we're all tourists <laughs> in this world. I don't, uh, I moved to Florida, mm -hmm. and five or six generations ago, the people, the uh, uh, American Europeans who lived there, you know, their forefathers moved to Florida. We all moved to Florida, and that's an attractive place. It's a fun place, not a pretty, as pretty as Minnesota in a lot of ways, but uh, no, I, Tourism is a hugely important industry in, in Florida, and I'll tell you this, the first casualty of a failed economy is the environment. So mm -hmm. tour, tourism is important. I don't resent them whatsoever, and no, I'm all for tourism. It seems like a lot of the uh, very talented, there's quite a few talented uh, Southern Florida writers. Well, and they're everywhere. All over the place. Uh, uh, James Hall comes to mind, and, and Edna Buchanan, Carl Hyacinth, and so yeah. on. But there's, there seems to be a streak running through at least some of them, you know, that is very anti-tourist, and you know, just send yeah. them all away, and let let Florida be what it is, and uh, not destroy it any further. Well, that's they're terrific writers, mm -hmm. and uh, but I'm not an anti-tourist person. It's as I say, we're all tourists to a degree in this world. So. You have um, a whole series, two series of books that, uh, when I've been doing some research, you know, 
usually crop up. Uh, Gross. <laughs> there's, there's a reason for that, perhaps. Um, but I was, I was curious because uh, you, you've written, what is it, seven books as uh, Randy Stryker and six, I think, as Carl Ram. Oh, God. I, you're breaking my heart here. <laughs> and, most, and I was amazed because the first, uh, the Randy Stryker books, all of them seem to have appeared between 1981 and 1982, and the others appeared over like a year and a half to two year period. It was a pretty prolific time. Yeah, the Randy Stryker books at uh, New American Library, Signet Books, an editor named Joni Hitzig, terrific lady, uh, uh, called and said, we want to do a, a series of books. I was a full-time fishing guide then. Mm -hmm and badly wanted to be a writer, had an old black Underwood stand-up typewriter. So when we want to do a series of books about a Key West charter boat captain, we've hired three other writers. We're going to come out with four at once. Hmm. We've hired three other writers. We would like you to try a chapter, and maybe you will be the fourth writer. So she said, but we have to have the first chapter in two weeks. <laughs> well, I wrote the entire book in 11 days. Oh, my God. I sent it to him, And uh, she called and she said, you think you can do this again? I go, absolutely. They <laughs> fired the other three writers. and. That's amazing. Yeah, I mean, well, I had a stretch of bad weather. <laughs> Wasn't fishing. <laughs> so I did uh, seven of those. And there, I, there was never a piece of paper that went in the typewriter, absolutely true, that I threw away. And so it's not, my name wasn't on it. Mm -hmm. And so it was never dear to me. It was a great, great exercise. Mm -hmm. The Carl Ram books, there was this editor at Dell named, I'm not going to say his name because he was so bad. Uh, and just had horrible instincts, and he came up with the plots, and just, I so hope he's not editing anymore. Mm. He's certainly not writing. So I hate those books, and uh, yeah, I don't lay really claim to those. But well, I, I thought it was interesting that even on your own website, you know, there's no mention of them whatsoever. It's no. Just a sort of but thanks very much for bringing them up, Bruce. It's very <laughs> kind it's, of you. It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. I always <laughs> want to make sure that we cover all <laughs> the background. True. I have a little hemorrhoid problem, too. You want to talk about that? <laughs> maybe, maybe offline. Okay. Part of what I was thinking about when I was looking at that list of books, beside the, the number of them and the uh, how prolific, that's the word I was looking for. Um, but in 1999, or 1990, excuse me, when Sandoval Flats came out, right. uh, you were hailed as a major new talent. And even as far as in as 1997, uh, one newspaper said, one of the hottest new writers in America. And I, w I was kind of half thought that might be frustrating for somebody. I mean, first and foremost, the seven years there, just right, the yeah. Ford series. But then you've got these 11 or 13 or whatever books behind you, uh, I mean, as far as writing is concerned. Right. That seem, does this seem kind of strange? Or? Yeah, I don't even think about it. I just do my work, and uh, the reviewers have generally been very, very kind to me. And I don't even think about it. It's just once a book leaves my little room, it's, mm -hmm. it's out there. It's like a child, except you don't have to buy them a pickup truck or pay their way through college. And, it's just, I don't even think about that stuff. Sanibel Flats, it's, uh, if you check on eBay in terms of people who collect first editions, Sanibel Flats, Flats may be certainly one of the most expensive books in America, I would think. I would imagine you're right. I think yeah. the first time that I became aware of you and, and the book, it was already, I think your second book was out in Sanibel Flats, it was already going for $1,100 or something like that. Yeah, first edition. And that's just astounding. Yeah, they only paid me 5000 to write it, so. Wow. So, Too bad so you didn't keep some. You could have I know, it. I could have made some dough. And uh, it was chosen as one of the, Sandoval Flats was chosen as one of the 100 best uh, thrillers or mysteries of the previous century. century. So it did honor. something right. So Quite an honor, yeah. I just write, do my work, and let the books fend for themselves. You, you had said at one time um, that uh, the third in the series, uh, The Man Who Invented Florida, was your favorite out of the series. Why is that? It's the strangest and the slowest and probably the most boring <laughs> of the, <laughs> the books. I just kind of like it. It's weird and floats around and I break a lot of rules, which I kind of like to do. And I think now probably 12 Mile Limit is my favorite, I would think now. It's, uh, I broke some rules in 12 Mile Limit. I go from third person to first person without explanation and uh, I kind of like doing that. Yeah, there, I noticed that um, in one of the um going from some of the earlier books to, to the later books, that um, you did switch person, either the, either directly from third person straight to first person, or right. again, from a variety of points of view. Um, do you find that difficult to do? I mean, does just hop into somebody else's head so quickly in the, as far as the characters are concerned? Yeah, it's all, all writing's hard, but it's, I just try to go by instinct and uh, write by instinct. Do you have, have you had any thoughts about doing a, another series along with, along with or? maybe ending at some point, the Doc Ford series? 
No, I love writing Doc Ford and Tomlinson. I love those characters. I want to do other books. I want to keep a, a journal of my house, this old house in the Indian Mound, a, mm -hmm. kind of a natural history book. Uh, I want to do a cookbook. Mm. And there's there are at least three other novels I want to write, and I will write if I stay healthy. And I will. Knock on wood. There's somewhere around here somewhere, yeah. Um, you've also done three nonfiction books, which are primarily, I guess, collections of, of, mm -hmm. of articles and whatnot. And... Um, one in particular, I th well, a couple in particular, I thought were just terrifically wonderful, and, and you can find these on your website. Um, one article, it was from September of 1996, The Big Queasy, out there, The Big Queasy, where you take James Hall out and... James uh, try, W. Hall. Yeah, and try and cure his, his seasickness. You know what, Bruce, I promise Jim Hall, Dr. Hall, I call him, mm -hmm. because he's so well-educated, and then, as he points out, oftentimes I didn't go to college, he points this out over and over again, ad nauseum. And speaking of which, let's get back to James Hall. Um, <laughs> There's a tech connection. He, uh, if Jim looks at a painting of a boat, he gets queasy. But I've promised not to talk about him getting terribly uh, upchucky sick one day on a very calm Gulf Stream sea. And it was like watching uh, Walt Disney throw up. But I've promised not to say that. And not, I not, won't. Not talk about James that, okay. W. Hall, the queasy king. Yeah. Well, people can, again, people can read it on the website, so you don't have to say anything. That's right, docford.com. Docford.com, that's really? my website. Or randywaynewhite.com. Uh, yeah, I, what, what I found anyway, rwwhite.com. Yeah, it's so. also docford.com, randywaynewhite.com. Oh, you get, all, get it out all that way. Yep. Well, I'm hoping that uh, all the folks that are watching will go out and check out the website and check out all of the books. They're all terrific. And Thanks, uh, we've Bruce. actually run out of time in this quick short time. You're I want terrific. to thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Appreciate it's been, it. it's an it's honor to be here. Thank you very thank kindly, you. my friend. Thank you.